Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'd like to cover Nick Sleep's investment partnership letters, specifically the letter from 2001. These letters are packed with wisdom from one of the greatest investors of all time. And I'm really excited to dig into these letters and share what I've learned from them. These letters have had a huge impact on Monish Pabrai's investment philosophy. And as you can see, Nick Sleep went through the same transition that Monish Pabrai did, where we go from cigar butt investing to basically near permanent long-term holdings. Sleep also covers the general philosophy of the investment partnership. So we'll dig into a little bit of that as well. Please let me know in the comments below if you've read Nick Sleep's 2001 letter and what your key takeaways were from the letter. Okay, let's jump into it. Here I have the full PDF of Nick Sleep's investment partnership letters. And I've made some annotations in the margins, just as I would if I were reading a book, for example. Just as a little bit of a background to these letters, they were actually not made public by Sleep and Zakaria until the spring of 2021. They had been floating around through random PDFs that people had somehow found and you know they were available to read but Sleep had never intended for these to be public works. Sleep's main motivation for releasing these letters was to help answer the question of what then? So of course he wants to share his wisdom that he learned through his career of investing but if you are blessed enough to strike it big and you know make a ton of money doing the investment game then what then what what do you do with all that money what do you do with your time because life really isn't all about making money he says investing is a wonderful thoughtful adventure but it can also be self-centered a tendency that can be reinforced by the wealth that can follow we think it is true that once past x amount real meaning comes with reinvesting in society through charitable giving which can also be a thoughtful challenging wonderful adventure, but with the added bonus that it feels like the world working properly. There are plenty more, but we have these three clear examples with Warren Buffett, Nick Sleep, and Monish Pabrai, all advocating for a philanthropic life after making a lot of money investing. I also think it's kind of cool that Sleep includes his letter that he sent to Warren Buffett back in 2014 when he closed up the fund. He really just wanted to thank Buffett for providing him with all of the knowledge that has gotten him to the point where he can now go ahead and continue with his philanthropic efforts. So this is a big thank you. And it's just a really cool relic of investing history, I think. And Buffett responds saying that he and Zach had made the right choice. He says, I predict you will find life is just beginning. The fund hadn't been open that long before Sleep sent out his first letter. The fund started in about September of 2001. And some of my key takeaways were that basically Sleep and Zakaria were generalists, not afraid to go anywhere in the world. And because Sleep now is known for holding such concentrated positions in companies like Amazon and Costco and Berkshire Hathaway, I was really surprised that at the beginning of his career, he had already made 18 investments. He also provides a little overview about what he's looking for in a business, which sounds almost directly from the words of Warren Buffett, where he says, we're looking for businesses trading at around half of their real business value, companies run by owner oriented management and employing capital allocation strategies consistent with long term shareholder wealth creation. This approach is pretty interesting because it has the elements of finding 50 cent dollars, which is kind of aligned with cigar butt investing. But he's also looking for rational management that is doing all the right actions for long term shareholder wealth creation. So sleep was looking for companies that are selling for half off, but he was also looking for rational management that were looking for the best interests of the shareholders and the long term wealth creation of those shareholders. And just like Warren Buffett, he likens investing to investigative journalism. He says one of the main features of these investment letters is to go through his investment investment ideas and explain the theses to his partners. Sleep's letters are typically divided up into two letters per year. One is the you know halfway interim letter and then the annual report at the end of the year. Okay, that's a little bit of an overview of, about some of the history of the letters and what Sleep was actually looking for in businesses as, as he was investing. So in this interim letter, he goes through two of his investments at the time, which were International Speedway and now it's a US company and then Maticon in Thailand. One thing to note about the international speedway investment is that it only made up less than 4% of his portfolio. So even his strong ideas that he is willing to share with his shareholders, it, he's not making huge heavy swings. So it's just one thing to keep in mind, it's, a, it's in large contrast to what he later evolves into, where he's got 70% of his portfolio in three positions. The general thesis was that International Speedway owned and operated 12 motor racing circuits 
around the United States, and it hosted 20 of the 39 NASCAR races. At the time, professional racing was very fragmented, but International Speedway was buying up all these circuits, and because of their exposure to all these raceways, they then had bargaining power with media companies for advertising. Sleep said before that they began consolidating, there were more tracks and sanctioning bodies than media buyers, but the tables had turned. NASCAR races mostly run on the weekends and it's hugely popular with middle class Americans. So there are these growing guaranteed media contracts and instead of taking all of the revenue for the company itself, they decided to split it up and incentivize other players. Sleep says that the firm may be deferring part of the windfall to fund future growth, which will be incremental to the escalating media income. International Speedway wasn't taking all of the revenue. They were splitting it with uh, drivers and teams so that potentially they will be more attracted and continue to grow the pot so even more competition will come and then that will bring even greater windfalls for International Speedway. So they bought the shares at a small premium to the replacement costs of the circuits and that was projecting only single digit growth for that business. So this is a great example of what Nick Sleep calls a rock solid franchise that the market was simply valuing as a mediocre business. The second investment is Maticon which is Thailand's second uh, newspaper, and it, it made up about 3.2% of Sleep's fund at the end of the year. It was a newspaper that appealed to a younger generation that had higher expectations for their quality of life going forward. My first thought when reading through this was that there's gonna be a really long runway for this newspaper. And the firm was family owned, and they were really focused on keeping costs low and raising long-term readership and margins. This amazing stat that Sleep reports is that cash flow in 2000 was 40% higher than 1996, but the sales were one third less. Basically, they sold the newspapers for nothing, but made money on the advertising revenue. Keep in mind, this company is in Thailand, so uh, there aren't a lot of investors who are comfortable going overseas and especially to Thailand where it's the market is clearly not as developed as the United States, for example. So the shares seem to be very cyclical, especially because of the cyclical nature of the advertising revenue that they were focusing on. So in 94, the shares were selling for $12 per share, but at the time of writing in 2001, the shares were selling for one US dollar per share and the company had no debt at all. So get this, the company was selling at 0.75 times their revenues and four times their estimated free cash flow. So this was valued at at least one third or even one fourth of the intrinsic value of the company. And it was owned 25% by the family. And on top of all that, there was a 9% dividend. I really enjoyed reading through Sleep's examples, especially in the early days, because it gives you a clear picture into how he was viewing his investments. Now, especially this Maticon investment, and I think Pabrai has said something like, if the idea doesn't hit you over the head with a two by four of how obviously cheap it is, then you probably shouldn't invest in it. And Maticon is one of those super obvious investments. And actually looking at the company right now, it looks like it's potentially selling for a similar price that it was in 2011. So maybe that's an interesting investment idea for now. He ends the letter talking about how almost one third of the fund is in cash and he's in no hurry to invest in companies if there isn't a fat pitch to swing at. The three criteria he mentioned before, which was companies selling at half of their intrinsic value with rational owner oriented management that was looking out for the long term wealth creation for its shareholders. He wants to see all three of those and if he doesn't, He's perfectly fine sitting on his hands. And that idiosyncratic trait that he shares with Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett will really help him a long way as we watch him evolve into his long-term compounder, basically permanent holdings approach. There's so much information packed into each one of these letters. That was his very first letter, and he went through two wonderful investment examples, even if they were closer to a cigar butt approach that didn't focus on holding the companies forever. You can really see how clearly Sleep thought about his investments. I hope you enjoyed my key takeaways from Nick Sleep's 2001 letter. This will be part of a recurring series where I will cover a year or two years of Nick Sleep's annual partnership letters. I think it'll be more helpful to break it down into a yearly or bi-yearly approach for the videos 
because of the sheer volume of information per letter. And again, let me know in the comments below if there are any more key takeaways you found from the 2001 letter that I didn't discuss in this video. If you like this video, you may like my video over here where I discuss Nick Sleep's chapter in the book Richer, Wiser, Happier by William Green. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with my upcoming series on Nick Sleep's investment letters. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your time and I will see you in the next video.